On behalf of the people of Hawaii and the friends of Iolani Palace, who maintain this gorgeous building, welcome this morning. This palace was built at the request of King Kalakaua back in 1882. He lived here, of course, and his wife Kapiolani, and then his sister, our eighth monarch, also lived here. So you're standing on a very historic piece of property. This is the only official home of kings and queens in the United States, the only official palace. Monarch of the Eo is the high-flying Hawaiian hawk. Lani is heavenly or royal. Royal Hawk is the name of this palace. There was another palace that stood on the same grounds by the same name, slightly to the east of us, but nowhere near as gorgeous as this building. Monarchy ended in 1893, and a succession of governments took over. I can tell you from personal experience, they were not the best tenants because my business in the late 1950s took me inside the palace, and I'll tell you some stories about that. So in the 1960s, we built the Capitol building there. We kicked the governments out, or we replaced them, into the Capitol building. And in the 1970s, we started the restoration, not only of this building, but of the 11-acre grounds. This palace cost $360,000 back in 1882. We've spent upwards of $15 million in restoration. I think you'll find it. We did a good job. E mai. Follow me, please. This is the entry gallery to Iolani Palace. I think the first thing I'd like to have you do is to look around and see how beautiful this architecture is. Remember, back in the 1800s, most Hawaiians lived in Hale Pili. H-A-L-E is the Hawaiian word for house. P-I-L-I -I is the Hawaiian word for grass. They literally lived in grass houses and a laborer lucky to make a dollar a day, you can see King Kalakaua in ordering such a gorgeous building to be built, really wanted Hawaii to stand out. This stairway would have probably caught your eye. It's made of koa. Koa is the upland variety of acacia. The Bible tells us that the ark was made of acacia, grown in another land, of course, but the upland variety has lots of rosin. That makes it very hard. Indeed, those are original steps. You can almost imagine King Kalakaua coming down to greet you personally this morning. Now, if you turn around and look at the doors, the framing on the doors is a special kind of wood from the Pacific Northwest. The etched glass was made in England and etched in San Francisco. Above the center door is the coat of arms of the ancient kingdom, very close to the same coat of arms we have now. The motto below dates back to 1843, Uamau ke'ea o the life of the land is preserved or perpetuated in righteousness. Hawaiians like to say, do what is pono, do what is right, do what is justice. Now, the poor chap in San Francisco had never been to Hawaii. He was asked to flank the coat of arms with a depiction of kalo. Kalo is the taro plant. Now, why should that be important? It's because it's a very, very popular food of the ancient Hawaiians, a staple food indeed. But the poor chap in San Francisco didn't recognize the picture he was given, so he added some lily flowers. I think that's um, uh, you know, artistic license, if you will. Now, the two giant bronze urns on either side of the front door uh, were given to King Kalakaua in 1883. What was the occasion? A coronation, two-week celebration. Thousands of people came here. And at the culmination of those ceremonies, gold crowns put upon their head. And later in this tour, I'm going to show you those very gold crowns. But some of the uh, another occasion uh, for a party in this place was 1886. What happened then? Aha, King Kalakaua's 50th birthday party. Actually turned out to be a two-week birthday party uh, because his subjects kept sending him food from the neighbor islands and he was duty-bound to handle it all. Now the portraits, starting in my extreme right, King Kamehameha I, also known as King Kamehameha the Great, because in 19, 1810, he unified the eight major islands under his single rule. The islands to the east of us, Maui, Molokai, Big Island, the rest of them, uh, his war fleets landed and 
defeated the local chief. History tells us that in 1795, over a thousand canoes landed on the south shore of Oahu, this island, and thousands of his warriors fought across the dusty plain, ending in a battle in Nuuano Valley just to the west. I read an account of that battle. There were 25,000 warriors involved in that, including women. Women went to battle with their men at a time when the standing army of the United States was only 3,500 men. Then for the next 15 years, he tried to get a fleet together to go to Kauai to finish the job, the eighth major island. Well, first the pestilence kind of reduced his force, then a storm kind of wrecked his canoes. So in, fifth, uh, in uh, <coughs> eight, 19, <laughs> in, in, uh, that year, what he did was he invited the king of Kauai to come to Honolulu. And the king of Kauai was a very practical man. And he said, Kamehameha, don't come over here and lay waste to my island with your army. I'll agree you can be the absolute ruler. So with that profession of fealty, now we have unification of the eight major islands under Kamehameha I, also known as King Kamehameha the Great, in 1810. The lady to his left is Kei Kauluohi, one of his 21 wives. He is said to have had over 60 children, but please understand this is before Christianity. Uh, when the whole system of Hawaii was governed by a pagan religion, a taboo system. Women couldn't eat with the men, they couldn't eat pork, they couldn't eat bananas. They couldn't participate in the political decisions of the men in the heiaus. He died in 1819 and the ladies decided they wanted no more of this and they planned a great big luau over in Kona, the west coast of the big island. And what they did was they invited Liho Liho, our next king, to come and sit down with them. Well, he was not about to do that because according to the pagan religion, he was going to be struck dead. But gentlemen, you know how persuasive women can be. And sure enough, he, they persuaded Liho Liho to sit down with him. And lo and behold, nothing happened. He was not struck dead. And that was the beginning of the end of the pagan religion. In the very next year, however, 1820, came the missionaries from the east coast of the United States. With them came monogamy and uh, Christianity. So when I say 21 wives before Christianity, I'm really talking about 21 special consorts. Well, if you had 21 special gals, why we just have the portrait of Kei Kaluohi? Number one, that's the only portrait of its kind that has survived the present day. But I'm going to tell you, she plays a very important part in later monarch history. He died in 1819. He succeeded by his son, Liho Liho, 22 years of age. He had five wives, but his favorite there was Kamamalu. Uh, the business of Hawaii in those days was sandalwood. And one of the biggest buyers of the sandalwood, much in demand for or chests and closets in the Orient, was Great Britain. So in 1823, four years into his reign, the two of them sail on a diplomatic visit and to see the world to London took London by storm, this handsome couple. Sadly, in 1824, they both die of measles, of all things, isolated out here in the middle Pacific. There was no natural immunity to white man diseases, but of course, also no modern medicine. But his death, he is survived by his younger brother, Alexander, only 11 at years of age at the time, but uh, another wife of Kamehameha guided him in the early years, later married Queen Kalama on the left, ruled for 29 and a half years, the longest of any of our monarchs. Interesting things happened during that time. 1840 was the first constitution, so he went from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. Also, 1848 was the great Maheli. And upon his death, he is survived by King Kamehameha IV, now a grandson of the original King Kamehameha. He's married to Emma Rook, now, R-O-O-K-E doesn't sound very Hawaiian, does it? It's not. It's because of a Hanai system whereby a child would be given, an infant would be given to an auntie, a sister, a close friend to raise, and the child would cleave to the new parents much more than the birth parents, and she was hanai to an auntie who was married to Dr. Rook. Now, Emma's quite famous in her own right besides the fact 
she's married to King Kamehameha IV, because in 1858-59, there was another epidemic, and the two of them raised the money to build Queen's Hospital. Emma is the queen of Queen's Hospital. Now, King Kamehameha had lots of children. We talked about that. None of these monarchs had surviving children. They had a young boy. Prince Albert unfortunately passed away at age four. They say daddy died of a broken heart a year later, ruled for about nine and a half years. Succeeded then by his uh, brother, Lot, King Kamehameha V, a bachelor, no wife, no children, um, a very uh, benevolent despot, if you would, much in love with his people passed the new constitution of 1864, ruled for about 10 years, and now upon his death, the Kamehameha line is gone. So we have to resort to the constitution of 1840, which required then a, an election. And the contenders were at that election, Kalakaua, but the winner was the gentleman on my far left, Lunalilo. Uh, he won the election of 1873 and came to power and uh, was, um, uh, could trace his ancestry back to a half-brother of, of Kamehameha, but he can do better than that. His mother was Kei Kaoluohi. She was a very young girl when Kamehameha I uh, passed away, lived to be about age 50, actually died about age 45, uh, had seven husbands during her lifetime, one of which sired Lunalilo, and he came to power in 1873 son of a gun, he contracted tuberculosis, ruled only for 13 months and passed away, and 1874, we have to have another election. This time, Kalakaua again, and the dowager, Queen Emma, but you know who built this palace? Kalakaua. Let's go in and meet Kalakaua. Follow me, please. Okay, the name of this room takes its name from the color of the furniture, the blue room. Actually, this gorgeous furniture was also in the first Iolani Palace we talked about before. Lily Okolani thought the furniture was so great, she brought it in here and did it in blue, and so we continued it. What would this room be used for? Concerts, teas, meetings? If this were an English manor house or a castle, this is what you'd call the drawing room. And probably not a coincidence, because three American architects finished the palace, they say one of which, however, was born and raised in England. Let me introduce you to your host this morning, David Laamea Kalakaua. Won the election of 1874 and came to power. Quite suited to be a king. Under Lot, King Kamehameha V, that you just met out in the gallery, he served as chamberlain in the old Iolani Palace. Now the chamberlain is the major domo who supervises his servants, makes sure everything runs smoothly for the royal family, but in the process, of course, he learned everything that needed to know about government. In those days, the missionaries operated what was known as a chief's children's school on the back of this property where the capital is located now, and the Kalakaua and his siblings, his brother and sister, and other children of the Ali'i, Ali'i are nobles, went to that school. So when they graduated, of course they spoke native, their natural Hawaiian language, but of course they spoke flawless English, which was a great advantage when you're dealing with other nations. Also before the palace was built, where the royal family lived, was an, a bungalow right next door, actually a fairly large bungalow, uh, called the Pink Bungalow because the lattice work was painted pink. That's where the royal family lived before the palace was built. Even after the palace was built, sometimes they stayed there. He kept an extensive library there. Very erudite man. Trained as a lawyer, also as a land appraiser, served in the House of Nobles. We had the British system of government back in those days. Um, very, very erudite guy, said to have uh, had a photographic memory, seldom forgot a name. Uh, seldom forgot a face, too. You see in the photograph, uh, the portrait of him, that he's in a military uniform. He loved everything military. We think it's because his daddy ran a cannon battery on the seaward slopes of Punchbowl, which is just behind the city and the palace, and to protect the mouth of Honolulu Harbor. And they say even as a teenager, he loved the pageantry and drill possibly even drilled the troops, and so he got a lifelong love of everything military. Now, when he came to power in 1874, that sandalwood had all been logged off. What's coming up is a new industry, sugar. But sugar needed a treaty from the United States 
uh, so it could be introduced without having to pay duty. 1874, the same year he was elected, off he goes to Washington, D.C. And as I tell my school kids on my tour, you don't get on United Airlines those days and get there in 12 hours. It's two weeks sailing ship to San Francisco, almost 10 days to, to Washington, D.C. But he was successful. He got his treaty. It was a reciprocal treaty. What did the United States get out of it? They got fueling rights at Pearl Harbor, this gorgeous strategic harbor in the middle of the Pacific. He was also the first foreign ruler to have a state dinner at the White House. Think how many state dinners we've seen on TV. His was the first. 1881, he took an even more ambitious trip. 10 months, 17 countries around the world. Started in the United States. First foreign stop was Japan, then China, then India. Um, Europe had an audience with the Pope. Uh, visited England again, and then the, uh, all of the grand houses of Europe. And I say that because back in those days, each country in Europe was ruled by a king, a queen, a palace, which means pomp and ceremony. So it's interesting to think of the timeline. 1881 is his trip around the world. 1882 is the completion of the palace. 1883 is the coronation. I'll bet you he got ideas for the last two events on that trip around the world. Now, gone for 10 months, somebody has to be in charge of Hawaii. So what he did was he appointed his sister, Lydia Pocky Dominus, to be his regent. And thereafter, she became known as Princess Lilio Kalani. Before, uh, in the fall of 1890, uh, the King took what was supposed to be a very short trip to San Francisco, supposedly on some Shriner business. Sadly, King Kalakaua passed away in San Francisco, January 1891, oddly enough, in the Palace Hotel, age 54, having ruled for 17 years, and now Princess Liliokalani becomes Queen Liliokalani. Before we talk more about her, let's talk quick, quickly about the gown. The organization for which I'm a volunteer, which is the Friends of Iolani Palace, is embarked on a program to duplicate 12 of the gowns worn by Lydia Kalani and Kapiolani. This is a duplicate of a gown worn by Lydia Kalani. Indeed, if you will take a look at the gown and the portrait, you will see that they are, uh, this is a copy of the same gown she wears in the portrait. She's married to John Dominus. John came to Hawaii, age five. His dad was a ship captain from New York, and we're indebted to the captain because he bought a beautiful piece of property a block away on Baratania Street. Baratania is a corruption of Britannia, and the captain built this magnificent house, her ancestral home. We call it Washington Place, another art museum today. John grew up to be kind of an interesting guy. He was uh, governor of Oahu for several decades and somebody she relied on for advice, and she needed it. Now, Lily Okalani had gone to the royal school, spoke flawless English, but she had no government experience whatsoever. Nobody expected that Kapiolani and Kalakawa were not going to have children. They did not. Nobody expected that he wasn't going to come right back from San Francisco. Sadly, he passed away, and all of a sudden, she's thrust into power. 1887 is a very interesting year, but that's the year that Queen Victoria in England is celebrating her Golden Jubilee, invited rulers from around the world to come and help her celebrate. Kalakawa chose not to go, but he sent his wife and he sent his sister, and off they went. They actually sat with the royal family in Westminster Abbey, high honor during the Jubilee. In their absence, the local populace made him sign a new constitution. Uh, they often referred to as the bayonet constitution because there was a little compulsion involved there. And when she came back and found out what he'd done, she was a little bit disturbed because number one, it had reduced her powers. She could hire ministers, she no longer could fire them, but worse yet, it had taken the vote away from the Hawaiians effectively because it said you have to own property. They'd always lived on the property. What do you need a piece of paper for? Well, when she came back, she had a, um, she had a, uh, a petition from her, uh, her constituents, uh, 9,000 I think on the thing, said, why don't you uh, do your own constitution? Why don't you restore our uh, voting rights? And so that's what she did in the January of 1893. She drafted a new uh, constitution. She presented it 
that day in this very room to her ministers. And they said, Your Majesty, we can't approve that. Number one, it's dictatorial. It goes farther than any other uh, constitution. But besides that, you swore to uphold the Constitution of 1887 when you were sworn in as queen, and you can't by yourself take and bring in a new constitution that may be considered treasonous. Books have been written about the events of those days, but suffice it to say that a group of American and European businessmen downtown deposed her. We'll talk more about that upstairs. Another interesting person in this room is Miriam Lique Lique, sister of Lily Okalani and Kalakaua. She's married to Archibald Cleghorn and a very smart American businessman. Their daughter is Princess Kailani. Cannot live in Hawaii very long without hearing the name Kailani. Hollywood made a movie about five years ago called Kailani, which was a beautiful travel log of Hawaii, but did not contain much historical truth. Said she was sent to England for safekeeping. No, she was sent to England to be groomed to be a queen, but sadly we lost her to a horse accident later. Let's go dine with the monarch. Follow me, please, into the dining room. We have many accounts of uh, what happened in the palace from newspapers. And we know from that that there was only one luau held in this formal dining room. They would normally be on the lawn. What if it rained? Well, what you do is you go downstairs, and the lower gallery contains an excellent spot for many dinner parties that have been held ever since. The chairs around the room, the chairs around the table, these three magnificent sideboards were made specially for the opening of the palace by the Davenport Company of Boston, Massachusetts. I named them specifically because later they also made the furniture for the White House. Now, Kalakawa wanted the best. Now, notice that the monarch's chair is in the middle of the table, not at the head of the foot, and that's because of communication. If it took two weeks for a sailing ship to get here, that means two weeks for a newspaper, certainly no computer, certainly no television, not even transpacific phone. So the only way the king could find out what was going on in the world was to have a meal, probably talk more important than food. Food would be prepared in the kitchen below, brought by a dumb waiter, a pulley system. My school kids say, why do you call it a dumb waiter? I said, because it'd be pretty dumb for a waiter to carry two platters of food up two flights of stairs when you use a pulley system. And so it would be served with a pantry and um, <laughs> he would invite perhaps a visiting minister who had just presented his credentials, maybe um, uh, a businessman. They say Robert Louis Stevenson ate at that very table. Uh, the opera star, in those days the opera house was right across the street, and certainly whatever ship was in port, the captain, the officers would be invited, and the king would find out what was going on, the wor on the, uh, in and on the world. Um, food, uh, just so you know that nobody ever starved, that particular menu that we have a, a copy of from 1883 started with fruit, then there were three kinds of fish. There was crab, there was mullet and kumu, kumu was a lovely goat fish, and there were three kinds of broiled food. There was beef, there was brains, there was chicken. There was three kinds of vegetables, asparagus, peas, and mashed potatoes. Three kinds of game, there was duck, there was pigeon, and kolea. Kolea is the western golden plover that comes here on migration. The king loved kolea. Kolea on toast was one of his favorites. Um, took a few to make a meal. And if you were still hungry, shrimp curry and chicken salad. Think about cooking that on now, a roaring open fire on a hot day. That's the only way they had to cook. Royal Hawaiian Band might be playing for the group on the lanai, certainly a string quartet, uh, maybe in the blue room. You need a long meal, you had a bathroom right here. Of course, it was uh, the height of uh, modern uh, uh, fixtures, hot and cold running water and flush toilets. Now the glassware on the table is from Bohemia, which today would be the Czech Republic. Now the king had the finest wine cellar in the Pacific, but those large flasks that you see were actually for water. So with so much wine, with such a long meal, the gentlemen could put water in the ladies' wine glass so they didn't fall asleep at the table, or worse yet, start to out-talk the king. These are the public apartments down here. We're going to go upstairs and see the private apartments. Follow me, please. Now, we talked about the stairway. The stairway downstairs is made of koa. That's the upland variety. That's lots of rosin. The table you see in front of you is ko. K-O-U is the lowland variety of the exact same wood, but less rosin 
easier to work, so that's what the Hawaiians made their tables out of and actually their food bowls. Let's go in and take a look at the king's bedroom. Follow me, please. In the late 1950s, I was a deputy attorney general for the then territory of Hawaii. There were only 14 of us in those days. I know somebody in the attorney general's office now, I think there's a, something like 180. But 70 years ago, we were a much smaller government. My job was harbor board deputy. I was the deputy attorney general for the harbor board. One young lawyer responsible mostly for statutes and regulations and things like that. But the legislature met downstairs. You've just been in those gorgeous rooms down there. It's hard to believe that the legislature actually was there, but it did. But if it passed the bill that affected harbors, then as the harbor board deputy, I was responsible for evaluating the bill, mostly the economic impact. Then I had to write a report to the governor. Governor, this is to explain bill number such and such. Um, I recommend you veto it. I recommend you approve it, whatever. The governor in those days was Bill Quinn, much older than I am, but another lawyer, and I knew him well. We were on a first name basis. I didn't call him Bill, I called him governor. But uh, several times he would call me on the phone and say, Willie, I need to talk to you about what you've written on Bill number such and such. And up those stairs in the Grand Hall I would come, and into this room I would come. This was then Governor Quinn's office. I didn't use the private entrance we just entered. I went through the secretary's office. When the overthrow took place in 1893, there were perhaps 10,000 different items in the palace. I'm talking about pictures and forks and spoons and curtains and rugs, 10,000 different things within the confines of the palace. After the government took over, Kapiolani's executor started to sell everything off. Lilio Kolani's executor, sold more things, government did the same. Over the years, people would buy things from those auctioneers, scatter to the four winds, and we've had a dickens of a time getting those things back. But we have been lucky to get 40 to 50 percent of the original contents of the palace back. If you take a look at the photograph that is on the easel, that's taken of this room in 1886. On the far side of that room, on the far right-hand side of that photograph, you see a round table. Actually, that's a tilt-top table. Look over there at the third window. You can see the tilt-top table back. And in the far corner, the blue Minton vase. Um, only four in the world. It's pretty imposing. Prometheus actually giving fire to the world. And then the sideboard, you can see that, and then the inlaid tables. Now the two vases on either side of the room are recent acquisitions. They were actually originally purchased by Kalakawa on that trip around the world in 1881 in Japan. Went through a number of owners, and the most recent owner has donated them to the palace. So we're showing them off proudly for your enjoyment. The round table in front of you is not the same round table in the photograph. We simply don't know where the one in the photograph is. What we have in the room before you is what we call a period substitute, much as the, like the piano in the blue room. They aren't original, but they were made and used someplace in the world in the 1800s, and we've acquired them and added it to the room for your enjoyment. The bed is, in fact, an original bed from one of the bedrooms in the palace, but it's not the king's bed. We know from descriptions that the king's bed was larger, made of uh, black onyx with gold gilt, but we simply don't know where, that, uh, where it went. The two feather things on either side of the bed are, of course, kahilis. They're made of black rooster feathers. They're symbols of royalty. That's simply why it's, they're on either side of King Kalakaua's bed. They, King Kalakaua's, they're supposed to represent King Kalakaua's mother and father. His father's name was Kapa'akea. Kea in Hawaiian is white, so if you look at those kahilis, you can see which one represents his father. The portrait on the far wall is said to be King Kalakaua's favorite portrait of his wife. They were married in 1863, the height of the U.S. Civil War. The cornerstone for this palace was laid December 31st, 1879, her 45th birthday, and certainly not 
a coincidence. In 18, uh, 1877, Kalakaua consecrated that gorgeous park out in Waikiki, Kapilani Park, also to his wife. Now let's talk about the poker table. We know that it's original because if you open the drawers, you see names and dates that go back to that period. It's uh, not in the photograph. It may have been in the sitting room. Each one of these corner rooms has a sitting room off to the right, but more than likely it was in the snuggery where it's been photographed. What in the world was a snuggery? Jutting out into Honolulu Harbor, the king had this magnificent boathouse. Water level had water craft, uh, racing yachts, and upstairs he had his favorite hideaway. All night poker parties, all night dinner parties. Uh, historians have called it his snuggery, which I love, and it kind of connotes what it was like. And there was the poker table. They tell a wonderful story about him playing poker one night with Claus Spreckles, the sugar king. As the evening wore on, uh, the king said, uh, got a little smile on his face, and he said, well, he said, I've got, uh, no, the Claus Spreckles said, I've got four kings, and he put down four kings, and he reached out, and King Kalakaua says, just a minute, Claus, I've got, happened to have four aces. And uh, Claus Spreckles took a look at the aces, looked at his kings, and he said, well, on second thought, I should win the pot, because I am really the king. He was uh, quite, uh, the kingdom was quite indebted to Claus Spreckles. This angered the king. It wasn't long after he borrowed money from London, paid off Mr. Spreckles, and he left Hawaii. Um, the, now, it's not a coincidence that the king's bedroom here and the queen's bedroom across the hall is on the north side of the palace, because that's north. Why? Because the, the, it is the northeast trade winds which keeps us cool. So if the king had something important to go to the next day, the six-foot windows would be all up, and the shutters you see are designed so they would block the light, but they would still let the air come through. But then how does he wake up? There's no clock radio been invented, no alarm clock. Well, maybe the system would have been that a servant would be come, come in chanting a, a ole, a chant maybe about his genealogy or the events of the day. But now the whole purpose is now, you don't want to wake the king up, paka ki. P-A-K-A-K-I is grouchy in Hawaiian. You don't need a grouchy king first thing in the morning, so it'd be soft chanting very softly as he opened the first window, chanting a little louder there, and then full voice, because I had to get the king up. And perhaps he would have said, Your Majesty, I've awakened you, but perhaps you'd like to take breakfast in the library. Let's go next door to the library and take a look. Follow me, please. Okay, they call this the library, but it really is the king's office. This is where the king would do his daily chores. This is where he'd meet with his five ministers almost on a daily basis. This desk is an original from one of his residences. Royal orders seem to be the thing of the day. It, uh, monarchs like to give each other royal orders, kind of a sign of equality. There's so many in the world. Look, this is a giant book. You can see how many royal orders in the world. Here's a uh, uh, four of the royal orders of Hawaii, if you'd done something spectacular for the kingdom, he would have awarded you with a royal order. The letters on the desk. Unfortunately, Miriam Lique Lique, Kailani's mother, also passed away much too early. The king composed a letter to all the monarchs uh, that knew her uh, to uh, announce the death. And the top one is a letter actually in French, which is the diplomatic language of the day, to the king of Romania, which was the uh, in that uh, French. And the second one is from the Vatican, of course, in Latin. And the next one is from the American president in English. And the last thing is a reproduction of a letter to the king on, from his subjects, all in Hawaiian. Underneath the table is a spittoon. My, children, my kids on my tour love the spittoon. So far as we know, he didn't chew tobacco, but he did smoke cigars. And perhaps the chewing of the ends, that's why the spittoon. On this right wall are mementos of that trip around the world uh, and England. Unfortunately, Prime Minister Disraeli on the left had just passed away before Kalakaua got there, but he was able to dine with Prime Minister Gladstone. Notice the picture on the wall above the helmet. That's Hastings. Remember the Battle of Hastings of 1066? Well, that's a picture of the waterfront of Hastings back in the 1800s. Uh, 
Remember, this is Victorian times, ladies and gentlemen. A woman would die rather than expose a wrist or an ankle. So what she would do is she'd go to a bathhouse and she'd put on a costume that covered her up entirely. Then she would go in a bathing cart to the water's edge, do her dip in the bathing cart, back to the bathhouse and preserve her modesty the whole way. 33 degree Mason, very, very proud, King Kalakaua, very proud of his Masonic uh, relationship. Um, I think one of the rooms downstairs has some mementos of the Masonic uh, orders that he, he received while he was there. Prince Edward, we'll talk more about Prince Edward on the other side. On the book on the uh, desk, one of them is Legends and Myths of Hawaii, co-authored by Kalakaua, very erudite guy. When he got to Paris in 1881, he saw a demonstration of electric lights. That so fascinated him, he actually met with Thomas Alva Edison when he traveled back to the United States. So in 1886, that 50th birthday party, the exterior of the palace and the grounds were electrified. Then the next year, in 1887, the interior of the palace was electrified four years before the White House. Four years before the White House. My school kids say, how in the world do you turn the lights off? Look at the walls. No switches on the walls. Well, the drill back in those days is the king would call or uh, to his superintendent of the powerhouse. We think a coal power, uh, powerhouse on the back of this property. Ah, he was environmentally astute. The wires went underground. He'd call over and say, I want lights off at 8 o'clock. And if you were reading a book, you were going to have to finish your book by candle. There was no other illumination. Now, uh, behind you on the wall is a picture of that first stop around the world in 1881, Japan. Mutual admiration society. The emperor of Japan threw this magnificent banquet for Kalakaua. During the course of the banquet, the emperor actually conferred upon Kalakaua the Order of the Rising Sun, the most prestigious order that Japan had to offer. Well, Kamehameha was flabbergasted for about 60 seconds, and then he invented on the spot the Order of Kamehameha, which didn't exist, and when he got to Paris, he designed it, had it made, and had it sent to the emperor. Pretty hard to get ahead of that guy, I'll tell you. Another interesting story about that picture in Japan. Now, the king was always looking for another political alliance, especially in the Pacific, but he was particularly taken with one of the Japanese princes. Thought he was a fine young man. He proposed, to the Japanese government a future marriage contract between that Japanese prince and Princess Kaolini. Now Kaolini was a very young girl at that time, but a future marriage contract. But the Japanese government would have none of it, said no. But how interesting to think, how different. Japan, Hawaii, the United States, and maybe the world had, would have been had that marriage taken place. Okay, this is a workroom. The next room is a music room. Let's go in the next room, the music room. This is the gold room. I think this is one of the most beautiful rooms, uh, restored rooms in the palace, but it really is a music room. The Hawaiians are marvelous musicians. They not only played for their own enjoyment, they composed. Uh, King Kalakaua composed the lyrics to our state anthem, which is Hawaii Ponoi, which in English means our own Hawaii, and his sister Lilio Kalani, a very prolific composer, over a hundred songs, perhaps Aloha Oi, Farewell to Thee, is the one you would remember the most. The portrait on the far wall is taken in 1884, and what she is wearing is her 18, Queen Kapiolani is wearing her 1883 coronation gown. They say the designer of the gown had something to do also with the painting of the picture. Behind her, you see a red and yellow garment. Ahu ula in Hawaiian, it's a feather cloak. Hawaiians used to make feather cloaks by putting sticky gum on the branch of a tree and snaring birds with red or yellow feathers, which is the royal colors but plucking only a few feathers, letting the bird grow to grow some more. So it took uh, decades, sometimes generations, to make a full-length feather cloak. If you've been to Bishop Museum and seen the feather capes, 
those are the lesser chiefs, the full-length feather cloak was only worn by the royal family. Now another interesting thing about that is Hawaiians consider Manu, M-A-N-U, the bird, to be messengers from the gods, bringing not only tidings, but mana. So to wear a full-length feather cloak would be not only to surround yourself with beauty, but to surround yourself with the mana or power of the gods. The screen below is a gift to King Kalakaua from the Japanese Council. From 1868 till the turn of the century, over 100,000 Japanese came to Hawaii to work in the sugar plantation, followed by Filipino, Chinese, uh, Portuguese, other races. That's why when you walk down any street in Hawaii, you see a rainbow of faces, almost all dating back to the immigration to work in the sugar. The red chair in the right corner is the actual throne of King Kamehameha III, who in 1843 said, O Uamau Ke'ea, O Ka'aine Kapono. Now the chair has been reupholstered, but wait till I take you to the throne room and you see the 23 carat gold thrones that Kalakaua ordered. Keep in mind how simple this one is. The, um, Little table on that far right, uh, wall, left wall, is uh, nondescript really, but it has an interesting story. We call it the Iowa table. Um, a, uh, Prince Coheo inherited that little table, and um, his, the Hawaiians are very hospitable and gracious and, and um, generous to a fault almost. And his wife, his widow, had a guests from Iowa and she admired the table so off she went with it. Well when she got back to Iowa she had nobody to leave it to so she left it up to the Iowa government. It ended up in the governor's mansion. One of the early curators found out about it, wrote to the Iowa government, said, you know really that's an artifact of Iolani Palace, can't we put it in the palace? They said sure, put it in the palace. Well in it came but then as we were working later was it ours? Was it a loan? Did we have to give it back? We wrote back to the Iowa government. We kept writing typical bureaucracy. Nobody answered our letters. Interesting story. Uh, on a docent tour in this room, one of was a teacher from Iowa and was told the story that we couldn't get the uh, title to that piece of property. She went back and got her eighth grade class to bombard the Iowa government. I looked it up in the internet called Give the Table Back Committee and they said, hey, that table doesn't belong to us, belongs to the Hawaiian people. And by golly, we got it on a permanent basis and that's why we call it the Iowa Table. The music box is said to be King Kalakaua's favorite. The box over here would be for liquor. If he wanted to take his uh, favorite liquor to the party, that's what he'd do. The tusks in the distance were one of the lavish gifts given to King Kalakaua on the occasion of his 50th birthday party in 1886. Let's go across the hall, please. The Hawaiian word for veranda is lanai. Not much used for speeches during the monarch period because nobody could make themselves heard. But once public address systems were invented, from right there in front of you in 1934, President Roosevelt came, made a speech, planted our state tree, that was 1934. Now in 1935, my father brought me here to hear Shirley Temple sing the good ship Lollipop from right there. I looked it up on the internet, 20,000 fans met the boat, at least half of them were here on the grounds at that time. She had to sing from all four quadrants. I was up on my dad's shoulders. We were both close to seven years old, but she was a much older woman. She was six months older. Follow me, please. Okay, we talked about the overthrow in 1893. Two years later, in 1895, there was a rebellion. Some loyalists tried to put Queen Liliuokalani back on the throne. Didn't work out too well, it was nipped in the bud. Then at first she was accused of complicity for taking part because some weapons were found in her garden in, Wa in Washington Place and then they wisely realized they belonged to her husband. Then she was charged with misprison. Misprison means you knew about the 
the rebellion in advance and you didn't warn us and that's treasonous by itself. Well, <laughs> to make a long story short, she was arrested, perhaps on some flim flimsy evidence, uh, January of 1893 and the next month, October, I mean uh, February, she um, had to suffered the indignity of a trial in her own throne room. And she was found guilty of misprison. Again, I'm not sure of the quality of the evidence, but and sentenced to $5,000 fine and five years hard labor. Hard labor she served in this very room commuted to house arrest. What did she do? She prayed, she wrote in her diary. I think one of the most beautiful Hawaiian songs is the Queen's Prayer, and that was composed in this room. And the other thing she started is what my grandmother would have called a crazy quilt. This is a patchwork of all bowl gowns, so in an original form was very, very flashy. It differs from another ball gown, of course, because of all the writing, Ku'u is my or mine, ha'e is flag, I love my flag. Center section is quite deteriorated, but contains a genealogy of Queen Liliokalani, a named regent, all those trips that he took around the world, and then her accused of crime and her, and well actually her ascension to queen, and then her accused of crime and her imprisonment here. She had two companions. Jenny K. Wilson was here during the week and another gal was here during the weekend. She was here roughly for about seven months and 25 days and then paroled. She had to stay on the islands for a short period of time, but within almost a year from the original trial, she was pardoned, never paid a diamond fine, eventually went to the United States and tried to talk Congress out of not annexing away. She was like her husband, she wanted to keep, or like her brother, she wanted to keep Hawaii for Hawaiians, but as you know, 1898 came annexation, we became part of the United States, and then a territory, just like Puerto Rico is now, and then statehood in 1959. Lilio Kalani came back to Hawaii, lived to be a ripe old age, 79 years of age, um, died in 1917, founded one of our Girl Scout troops. Join me in the next room, please. Now this room doesn't have any furniture because it was a guest room. Palace was finished in 1882 and the royal family moved in. 1883, the following year, Kapiolani realized she had a widowed sister. Sister's name was Keikau Like Piikoi, Keikau for short. And she had three boys. And so essentially, Kapiolani said, Sister, you've got no husband, three boys. We have this great big palace. Come live with us. And in 1883, that's what came to pass. The Keikau lived in this room, and the three boys lived in what later became the imprisonment room. There was Edward, there was Jonah, and there was David. Uh, King Kalakaua thought so highly of these teenagers that he named them princes of the realm. Now that's interesting. They're not Kamehameha, that line has died out. They are not related to Kalakaua, but of course they're related to Kapiolani. She and Keikau, sisters from Kauai, are of royal blood because their grandfather was the same king of Kauai who said to Kamehameha I, don't come over here with your army, I'll agree that you can be the absolute ruler. Now Jonah, uh, P. Koi, took one of his middle names, Kuhio. He was our delegate to Congress when we passed basic legislation, so March 26th of every year, we celebrate Kuhio Day. The eldest, David, David P. Koi, took one of his middle names, Kawanako. And if, and Queen uh, uh, Lilio Kalani thought so highly of him, she named him her heir in case she died in office. She didn't die in office, but if this were a monarchy, a Kwanakoa would be on the throne, and I know they're around, because I went to high school with one of the girls. Now let's go back in time. Uh, 1885, unfortunately in 1884, Keikau died, and so these boys have no mother, no father. They are wards of the king and queen who loved them. They were sent in 1885 to St. Michael's Military School in San Mateo, California to further their education. On an outing, they go to Santa Cruz Beach. What do you think they see at Santa Cruz Beach? 
nalu, which is the Hawaiian word for waves. They go to a lumber yard, they make surfboards out of redwood, and there is to this very day a plaque at Santa Cruz Beach, attesting to the fact that the very first surfing in the United States was by the three P Koi Boys in 1885. Now in 1912, back from the Olympics, comes Duke Ohanamoko, our famous swimmer and surfer, and he goes to Southern California, and he starts surfing in Southern California. Now those crazy Southern Californians think they started surfing, but you know the truth. Three P Koi Boys, Santa Cruz Beach, 1885. Let's go see the Queen's bedroom. Okay, this is Queen Kapiolani's bedroom. And uh, it's all done in red, which is the royal colors. Um, <laughs> Queen, uh, also in this room is another one of those gowns. So let's talk about the gown. Here in the room is a reproduction of Kapiolani's dark, satin gown that she wore to the Jubilee in 1887. Queen Victoria asked the ladies who were invited, the queens, to please wear something typical from the country from which they were arriving. <coughs> Nothing is more typical in Hawaii than hulu. H-U-L-U -U is the Hawaiian word for feathers, and lo and behold, the original would have had epaulets and ropes of feathers. Now, 1887 and the Golden Jubilee, I told you King Kalakaua chose not to go, but he sent his wife, Kapiolani, the lady on this picture on this uh, easel, and he sent, of course, his sister, uh, Queen Liliokalani. Um, Queen Liliokalani was accompanied by her husband, John Dominus. He was still with us in 1887. Uh, uh, Kapiolani was accompanied by Curtis E. L. Kea, a very, very smart uh, Chamberlain of the day. Now take a look at Liliokalani's hair, the lady on the left. I do not know what you call jewelry, a brooch perhaps. That's 159 diamonds two ruby eyes, it's a diamond butterfly. It's so ingeniously made, there are little springs in the wings, so that when she walked, the wings tended to flutter. She paid 400 pounds for that in London, priceless. I have no idea what it'd be worth today. One of the things you're gonna go into in the lower gallery, personal possessions of the royal family, look for the diamond butterfly, we got it back. My school kids leave me like they're on an Easter egg hunt. The bed is, in fact, Queen Kapiolani's bed, as is the motto on the pillow. Kulia means to strive. E kanu'u, to the summit. Strive to the summit, or in the vernacular, do your best. I think that's a motto for all of us. Back to the elevator and the throne room, the piece de resonance. Follow me, please. Okay, this is the throne room, the ceremonial center of the Alani Palace. Lots to talk about, but here again are the gowns. Remember I told you the significance of Hulu, the feathers and the gowns in 1887 uh, Jubilee. On the left is a reproduction of Queen Kapiolani's peacock feather gown. Reproduction, of course, but you can imagine what a sensation that was when she appeared in that in London. I'm told it weighed, the original weighed 50 pounds, and she wasn't a very large woman. The gown on the right was one of Lilio Kalani's gowns. The chairs on my right are part of that original manufacture from the Davenport Company, who I told you later made the furniture for the White House, as are the thrones. Now take a look at those thrones, ladies and gentlemen. Remember that simple red chair that King Kamehameha III had? Look at this, twin 23, carat gold thrones. Now the upholstery on the thrones is original, and the reason for that is at the time of the overthrow in 1893, the thrones were taken to Bishop Museum for safekeeping and then brought here uh, during the 1970s when we did the restoration of the palace. The structure, the upright between the two thrones, we call a pulohulohu. It indicates the presence of royalty. Well, that's why it's between the two thrones. In ancient days, it simply would have been a spear stuck in the ground with a wrapping of tapa or kapa cloth on top, but serving the same purpose. 
warning to the populace, don't you go past this point, royalty is there, probably very severe punishment in those days. But what you see before you is simply symbolic. The upright is the tusk of a narwhal, which is a marine mammal, and the ball on top just simulates what in ancient days would have been a wrapping of tapa or kapa cloth. The two white kahilis flanking the thrones are made from the feathers of the Laysan, L-A-Y-S-A-N, uh, island albatross, carcasses, ladies and gentlemen, we didn't kill the birds. In ancient days, it is said that each member of the royal family had a kahili in a distinctive pattern and color only unto themselves. So when they went out in public to notify the public that royalty was coming, the kahili bearer would precede them, and the kahilis were so distinctive, all you had to do was look at the kahili, and you'd know immediately which member of the royal family was coming behind. The derogatypes are what I call giant lockets on the wall, contained royal orders given to King Kalakaua from other nations. The six chandeliers you're standing under here, and the one you stood under in the blue room, original from the 1887 electrification of the inside of the palace, remember, four years before the White House. Now the giant rug. The giant rug posed a problem to the um, auctioneers, so what they did, they snipped it up. It's a reproduction you're standing on, but I'll bet you, if you were here 140 years ago, you would not know the difference, and I'll tell you why. One of the pieces from the original rug was found in a museum in Tacoma, Washington. So what you're seeing today is almost identical to the pattern and the color of the original. Now under the glass case in front of you are the actual crowns used in the coronation of 1883. The larger of the two crowns was handed to Kalakaua and he placed it on his head. The smaller of the two crowns was handed to him for his queen. Well, I've heard of an apocryphal story that uh, Queen uh, Kapiolani wanted to get all gussied up for her um, coronation, so she sent for her favorite hairdresser, who unfortunately provided a beehive hairdo. And accounts of the occasion said she had a little, the king had a little difficulty settling the crown on his head, but it was accomplished according to the newspaper reports. Now the sword and scepter of power in the same glass case, now you know he got ideas for that on that trip around the world in 1881. Together with all the printed invitations, uh, all of this would have been manufactured, made in London. We estimate the cost in the dollar of the day between ten and twenty thousand dollars. Remember, that's at a time when a laborer was lucky to make a dollar a day. Now, the three giant mirrors on the left wall are original. You can imagine what sights they've seen: weddings, funerals. But one of the things they would have seen is a royal ball. Two or three times a year, the uh, royal family would have a royal ball, and if you were lucky enough to be invited, you would have an engraved invitation delivered to your place of business or home. And up you would come in your finery. Now the only way Milady could get around in those days was walk, horseback, open carriage, or mule, pool, tram, or trolley. So to leave home and travel through dusty Honolulu and arrive at the palace in your finery, what did she do? She wore a cloak. So the big room that you passed as before you entered the blue room, the original cloak room. Your carriage would have come through the dignitary gate. There are four gates to the palace. The King Street gate is the dignitary gate. That's you. The uh, East Gate is for the royal family. There was a guard there to make sure that was true. The North Gate was for the uh, servants, and the West Gate, or Eva Gate, was for the uh, tradespeople that came to do business. But your carriage would have come to the front steps. A member of the household would have uh, greeted you. You had been presented to the king and queen, and it wouldn't be long before the music would start. Now, Henry Berger was our bandmaster for many decades. He always prepared a dance card, typically maybe 14 items. Maybe the first one would be Waltz by Strauss, then a line. Then Foxtrot by so-and-so, and a line. What was a line for? 
No cutting in on the dance floor. Back in the monarch days, he went up to the lady of your choice and asked if all the numbers had been spoken for. And she said, no, nobody's spoken for number four. Well, could I have that? If she thought you were appropriate, your name would be written on the fourth slot. And you would, when the orchestra played the fourth number, you'd get to dance with the lady of your choice. And if you were particularly good looking or the wife of a dignitary, you'd have had a great souvenir Kalakawa would have danced with you. He loved to dance with the ladies. Two o'clock, no, midnight you'd go across for midnight supper first and then back for some more dancing. And about two o'clock in the morning, the king would repair upstairs. You'd hear the clatter of your carriage coming to the front steps and you'd know your gala evening would be over, hopefully with some great memories. And this ends our tour too. I hope you come back and see us. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks to our ThinkTech underwriters and grantors, the Atherton Family Foundation, Carol Monley and the Friends of ThinkTech, the Center for Microbial Oceanography Research and Education, Collateral Analytics, the Cook Foundation, Dwayne Carisu, the Hawaii Community Foundation, the Hawaii Council of Associations of Apartment Owners, Hawaii Energy, the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, Hawaiian Electric Company, Integrated Security Technologies, Galen Ho of BAE Systems, Kamehameha Schools, MW Group, the Scheidler Family Foundation, the Sydney Stern Memorial Trust, Volo Foundation, Yuriko J. Sugimura. Thanks so much to you all.